Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this first online event for the Brisbane Writers' Festival. My name is Michaela Kolofsky, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here tonight in conversation with Sasha Sagan. I wanted to start tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am tonight, who are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where the Brisbane Writers' Festival home is, the Yugara and the Turrbal people, the traditional custodians of that land. On behalf of Brisbane Writers' Festival, I acknowledge and welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait people who are here with us tonight, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, very quickly, I'll just tell you about how we'll run things. I'm going to speak with Sasha Sagan for about 40 minutes, and then we're definitely leaving time for you to ask your questions. And you can do that through the YouTube live chat, or if you're on Facebook, via Facebook Messenger through the Brisbane Writers' Festival page. I also want to let you know that tonight's interview is being recorded so people can watch it at a later stage. Before I start our conversation, I need to tell you a bit about Sasha Sagan and her background. Sasha Sagan holds a degree in dramatic literature from New York University and has worked as a television producer, filmmaker, editor and writer and speaker in New York, Boston and London. Her essays and interviews on death, history and ritual through a secular lens have appeared in New York Magazine, O, The Oprah Magazine, Literary Hub, Mashable, The Violet Book and elsewhere. Her short film, co-written and produced with Kirsten Dunst, was screened at the Tribeca Film Festival and was one of two films chosen to close the 2010 Cannes Film Festival's Critic Week ceremony. She regularly speaks on ways science can inform our celebrations and how we mark the passage of time. For Small Creatures Such As We is her first book. In this case, it's also relevant to mention her, both her parents, who are Anne Druin, an Emmy and Peabody Award winning American writer, producer and director specialising in the communication of science, and the late great Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was an astronomer, cosmologist, astrophysicist, and one of the most powerful and effective communicators of science in the world. He did research into the existence of extraterrestrial life, and he assembled the first physical messages that humans ever sent into space, the Pioneer Plaque and the Voyager Golden Record. They were universal messages that could potentially be understood by any intelligent life in the galaxy. Together, Anne and Carl also made the hugely successful television series Cosmos, and Carl Sagan died in 1996. Sasha Sagan has written that incredibly rare book, It's About the Wonders of Science, but it's also a deeply moving and personal book about loss, and about family heritage. She's also given us a guide for how we can make meaning and create our own rituals to sit alongside spirituality or in place of them. Tonight, I'm gonna to speak with her about family, about how their scientific worldview informed her, about rituals, the mysteries of the universe, grief, and why she finds randomness so beautiful. Sasha, welcome to this Brisbane Writers' Festival event. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, thank you. So uh, first and foremost, a, a funny way to start a conversation with an author of her own book, but, but in this instance, people will understand why. I need to start by asking you about your parents. I wanted you to explain a bit for people who weren't familiar with Carl Sagan, um, you know, what his work was, and I think what his legacy is, and what you learned from him, as well as what you learned from your mum. My parents um, collaborated uh, on dozens of books and essays. And as you said, the, the television series Cosmos, which my dad hosted. And together, I feel that they did something so unique in terms of making science accessible in a way that wasn't just about the list of information that you might have to memorize in school, but about the stirring beauty of our place in the universe as revealed by science. And, you know, the passion and joy that they found in the, the information that's supported by evidence was contagious. And it, growing up, it was contagious. And I think for millions of people around the world, it was contagious. And I was so lucky to have that framework um, to see the world from very early childhood and a huge emphasis on curiosity and um, a, a deep love of questioning. And I think that really formed my worldview and formed my outlook. And you know, if you've read their work or, or seen anything that they created, I think that um, you will get a real idea of what it was like growing up. And, and just the idea that 
you know, science is a constantly changing thing. We're constantly looking for new information, looking for a deeper understanding, looking for a, a little more glimpse of truth, of the reality of the world the world around us and it's so new in human history so much of the information we have but i think the way that we follow the evidence and seek to understand is very ancient um i wanted to ask you as well whether you had any thoughts on what shaped your father's belief in science or views about science because he was the the grandson and great-grandson of, of orthodox jewish people and yet his own life and direction was quite different. Why do you think he was felt so so much freedom to pursue the work he did in the way that he did? I think that one of the, and he talks about this in Cosmos and elsewhere, I think one of the real turning points in his life, you know, his parents were immigrants and um, they were not very well educated, but when he was a little boy in Bensonhurst in, in Brooklyn in New York City, um, he really, he wanted to know what the stars were and no one he knew knew the answer. No adult he knew knew the answer. And his, but his mother knew where he could get that information and she took him to the public library, which was like, you know, a schlep. <laughs> um, and it was, and, but she, but the idea was you have a question. I don't know the answer, but I can help you find it out. And I think for a very small child, even in a, in a community that was not highly educated, um, that encouragement, that moment can, was like a turning point that, that shaped the rest of his life. And I think that, you know, his parents valued learning, even if they didn't have the resources or the experience to be the source of the knowledge that he was looking for. And I think that 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 shaped his life tremendously. And I think that that's something that, you know, all of us uh, parents of young children who have the, you know, why, 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 why phase um, can really relate to this idea of, okay, well, I may not have all the answers, but I'm going to help you find them. And that was really something that, that I think meant the world to him and changed his life. There seems to be a bit of a, a wonderful heritage in your family of people um, I think always questioning, but also still being embraced by their families when they did so. Can you tell a little bit about the story of your uncle Harry? And I promise. Oh yes, my grandfather. Yes, my grandfather. Yes. Um, so on my mother's side, her her grandparents were Orthodox. They came from Eastern Europe. Came to New York from Eastern Europe. And um, my grandfather was born in, in New York and he grew up and went off to college, which made him, you know, skeptical and cosmopolitan as it can do. And um, the story that was passed down to me that really, uh, I write about it in the book and it really stayed with me um, was one day he came home you know, riding the train home, the New York City subway with just that knot in his stomach, um, uh, and gets to his parents' house and he finds his father davening, praying, um, and he waits for him to finish. You know, that that feeling when you have to have a difficult conversation with someone, I can just picture that, that tension. And um, he said, Dad, look, I've, I've got to talk to you about something. I... Um, I'm not going to go to shul, to temple anymore. Um, I'm not going to keep kosher. I'm not going to keep Shabbat um, because I don't, I don't believe. And his father looked up at him and said, the only sin would be to pretend. And that, that idea that, you know, if, if you don't, if, if it feels like going through the motions, don't do it. You know, follow what works for you and, and, and the idea that there's no, you can't force it. You can't force belief. You cannot force non-belief. If, if it's not there, it's not there. And that that's not a reason to have a rift between father and son or between family members. And, you know, after that, we, my grandfather still the rest of his life, he lived to be 99, saw himself as Jewish and we had, you know, secular Passover Seder and we had Hanukkah and we had these things in our family 
that were so the markers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't in the theistic context that he had been brought up with, but still carrying on these traditions. It's a very powerful response to your son yeah. when you've left Eastern Europe at that time and you're in a new country and in effect, all you have of your old identity is that cultural identity, that ethnic right. identity. It's a very, it's a very powerful and very loving response. And it's a bit like your parents who you write in the book were always thrilled. If they, if you ask them a question that they didn't know the answer to, that was like the mark of a really great question. I think that tells us a lot about the household in which your, your mind and your heart were shaped. You've also said that your parents had the ability to make science spiritual. What do you mean? Oh, it's, it's so interesting because sometimes the language, you know, spiritual has such a theistic religious connotation and words like holy and sacred and even magic comes from a theistic root. Um, but it still is, I mean, maybe it's just the poverty of the English language, but it's still, those are still the words that I think best describe that feeling when, you know, a light opens up in your mind when you understand something new. And when you, 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 there's a new discovery or a new image from deep space. And all of a sudden you have chills all over your body and you glimpse that that way in which we are a part of this vast, enormous grandeur that we can barely, barely, barely begin to wrap our minds around. I think that is spiritual um, in the secular sense. And I think that my parents awe and joy and wonder um, was the same, you know, in many ways, that same deep feeling that people often derive from religion, but they derived it from the scientific method and all the astonishing things that we have learned um, just from following the evidence wherever it leads. I'm deliberately asking these questions about your family because I want um, people who are with us tonight to get a sense of the I suppose the heart as well as the the love of the rational and the love of the evidence-based as well. Um, but your book is entitled For Small Creatures Such As We, but that's only half the sentence. And it's actually a sentence that was written by your mother. Can you, yes. can you tell me? Because you said it, you say in the book that that sentence is kind of a family mantra. Can you finish yes. that sentence for us? Yes. So the rest of the sentence, it's in the, the novel contact, um, is for small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. And I think that there's something so powerful about that idea. If we, you know, on the other side of the kind of existential crisis of, ah, we're tiny in, on a little out of the way planet in this enormous vast universe. And we are here for the blink of an eye and maybe there's nothing else. Once you get through that very difficult <laughs> realization and face it, it's like, well, then what do we have? And I think that the answer is one another. And we're here on this little lifeboat floating through the cosmos together. And I think that if we don't, we don't know, you know, if there's anything else, if you have deep faith, you know, maybe that doesn't seem true to you. But for those of us who reserve belief without evidence, if this is it, then we are in it together. And I think the more that we can derive fulfillment from this moment, I think the better off we are. You've spoken powerfully about the way that your, your parents were raised and the kinds of things that shaped their worldview. But can you talk a little bit about your own your own way of using science as a lens through which to both see the world and understand the world, because it's very much a part of this book. Yes. I mean, for me, um, you know, I think that science is the pathway to understanding and it's the way to answer questions. And there's a, it's the way to look at information um, to try to figure out what's real and what's not, which is something that is, you know, on a small scale and a large scale, something that the human species has to reckon with. But I think that one of the things that I really long for and, and that science, I thought, doesn't provide is the rituals and celebrations um, and, and a framework for grieving. These moments in life that are part of our existence and, and all the changes that we experience, the changing of the seasons, the, the biological change over a human life, 
And, um, and so, you know, I lean on my Jewish background for a lot of those things. But as I began learning about this, and of course, I lost my dad when I was 14. And so I had to come to terms with how to face mortality and and deal with it and grieve um, at a you know at a young age and um, and I think that as I began researching not just um, the funerary and like mourning rituals around the world but the celebrations and the seasonal change you know the the moments that we celebrate the spring equinox and the winter solstice so many of the holidays that I thought were purely religious or purely cultural had this kernel of a scientific event underneath it. Um, and, you know, coming of age ceremonies, that's the, the most clear um, version of that. And I started to think, you know, of all of these events that, you know, independently societies all over the world and throughout time have had these moments, um, you know, whether it's like quinceanera, bar mitzvah, sweet 16, or, you know, all these rites of passage that you, you can find anywhere in the world. Um, that, that that's really about a biological change. And that's really about hormones and the ability to reproduce and all these things that we don't think of as part of a, you know, religious or cultural tradition. There's this kernel of science underneath. And so um, that combination of having a desire and a love for celebrations and um, also, you know, this lens of, well, what's really going on here and, and what's the root of this sort of led me to, to the research that eventually became the book. You write, um, you actually quote your father in your book when he wrote in Pale Blue Dot, science demands a tolerance for ambiguity. And it struck me because when we think about science, you know, the phrase cold hard facts often comes to mind. And I was thinking about that in relation to the fact that you, you talk about your love of science, your way of using scientific ideas to make sense of the world, to see the world, but also your yearning for ritual and the way that you still find deep meaning in the, in the mysteries of the universe. But we don't tend to think of science as being ambiguous. Do you think science has kind of like an identity problem? Do we need to, do we need to rebrand it somehow? <laughs> to, um, yes. It yes, it's so true. I mean, that, that idea of cold hard facts, it's so unpleasant you know it says it's not it's not welcoming yeah yeah it's not welcoming but I think that when we think about I mean the, the example I love to give the most is like you know if you said to kids instead of being like here is this homework about alleles and double heat and the double helix if you said there is a secret code in your blood that connects you to your ancestors to people that you never knew and whether you believe in it or not, it's real. And it can tell you information about yourself that you didn't know and about your history and where your ancestors were when. It can solve mysteries, you know, of thousands of years old mysteries, like what, what, what happened to Tutankhamen? You know, these things that we can discover and understand and it's hidden just beneath the surface, but it's the answer to so many of our deepest questions. If we could sort of present DNA that way, instead of in a very like, you know, I don't know, true crime, unpleasant, you know, way, um, I think that there's so many elements of um, nature that if we turn the lens a little bit and find the part of it that is just the astonishing beauty of it, and then, you know, start there. I think we can sort of change the way we look at things because it can be very hard when you think of it as just rote memorization and it's as something that's stagnant. And I think that's one of the things I love most about science is the idea that you, you know, the constant questioning and the constant idea that what we know today is just the best we can do right now, but we will understand more later and we can only get there by um, questioning ourselves, questioning the status quo, questioning what we've believed, and testing things outside of what we want to be true or what we thought were true, and actually looking at the evidence. And I think there's so much beauty. You know, there's so many things that if you learn it from early childhood, it doesn't seem, you forget how amazing it is. I mean, even just that plants grow out of the earth with 
you know, the light of the nearest star and water and the nutrients in the soil and we consume them and we grow and live. If you, if you told that, like it was a fairy tale, you know, it sounds astonishing. And I think there's so much in nature and in science that can be sort of described in a different way. Um, but in terms of tolerating ambiguity, I think we have this deep need to answer our questions. It's so uncomfortable. We all have this feeling of the discomfort of not knowing. And you know, the idea that an answer will come eventually or it won't, but right now we don't know. And the urge to put an answer into those deep questions or even small questions, what's gonna happen tomorrow, you know, those kind of things. Um, is it's it's really difficult to sit with that feeling of well we just don't know yet and so I think that that's something that science provides that's really um, important is the idea that until we have evidence we just we don't have uh, an answer and I think the more we get used to that feeling I think the better the better off we are. There seems to be this big um, uh, I guess a shared a shared sense of the mystery of the universe, both in religion and in science. Maybe just they have different ways of grappling with it. And you write about this all throughout your book, because as you've said before, you weren't raised, you were, you were raised more or less in a secular way with with some kind of, I guess, um, uh, traditions of, of Jewish culture and with your husband now, traditions of, of his own Christian and Catholic culture as well. So lots of things that are sort of interwoven for you and your new family. But I, I wonder if you can explain a bit about something you also write about in the book, which is that the way that in science things can be provable and somehow making things provable makes them somehow less special. Why, do, why are we humans like that? Why do we think if we can define something or prove it to ourselves, it's somehow less magical? It's such a good question. And I, I, I don't... <laughs> I, you see it so often when people say that they prefer the kind of mystery of something and they don't want to know the answer. Um, and like, I think, you know, to me, understanding something really deeply and studying it is a way of honoring it and celebrating it. And it's like when you're in love with someone and you want to know everything about them, every little detail, to me, that is better than just watching them from afar and living in your own fantasy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And projecting your own wishes onto them versus saying, who is this person really? I want to know them very deeply. And I think that there's something there that, that connects to, you know, how we how we approach the deep, profound questions of life, you know, anything from, you know, what happens after we die to, you know, is there life anywhere else in the universe? And um, I think that following the evidence to find the information that we can glean um, and leaving the space open until we have evidence is more stirring and meaningful and powerful and beautiful than saying, I know this, I think I want this to be true. And so I'm filling in this answer here. Um, but to me, yeah, I mean, you see it, I, I've said this before, but you see it like um, with meteorologists on TV when there's like a big storm coming. These are people who are scientists who study weather and they love it. And the excitement that they feel about you know the weather systems coming in and how it works is like ecstatic joy you know standing outside getting the wind blown on them or whatever it is um, and I think that you that there is that in science where when you understand something deeply you know for many millennia we thought the weather you know big weather events were messages right exactly and I think that you know now that we understand a little bit more how things work, um, there's still immense beauty and awe that can be derived, again, from this, this other element of nature among many. Throughout the chapters in the book, which are divided into things like, you know, weddings, sex, coming of age, death, you know, autumn, summer, um, winter, you also look at lots of religious traditions and you look at lots of ways that different religions mark um, seasons, times of the year, and all those big moments in our lives, births, births, coming of age, and um, marriages and death. 
But I wonder, having heard you just say what you've said, why do we still have this schism between this massive schism between science and religion, given the kind of research that you've been doing? What do you put that down to now? Also, having grown up in the household you grew up in. I, you know, um, I think it's very new, really, in the history of human, in the history of our species. I think that for most of history, the more deeply you understood the migration patterns, the weather, the seasons, reproduction, um, the more deeply you understood your gods or God. And I think it's really only when we had enough information to say, well, but this thing that we've said for a few hundred years or a few thousand years, now we have this information. I mean, my mother calls it post-Copernican stress disorder, like this idea of like, oh, we're not the center of the universe. And actually we revolve around the sun and the sun is like a little distant out of the way star in a- She does need yeah. to trademark that. Yeah, absolutely, right? Um, and maybe there could be like some kind of therapy to help people get through it. But you know, I think it's, yeah, I think it's this idea of facing the I that we are not, the center of the universe, literally, we're not the center of the universe, and metaphorically, we're not the center of the universe, and we're part of, even on this planet, we are part of an ecosystem of other animals and plants and life forms, um, and we, it's not just made for us, and I think that that is really, can be quite damaging to our egos, and I think it's really hard, you know, if you, especially if that gives you a sense of um, esteem. And there's this video of my dad um, that I recently saw again, um, you know, from probably 30 years ago, where he's saying, you know, I wish that we could derive our self-esteem as a species, not from being born special, but from things that we actually do and things that we can ways that we can make the world more fair and more equal and more just and um, that that would be something that we can derive our sense of our importance from rather than just being born special as human beings. I want to talk a bit about rituals in specifics. Um, all, th all throughout the book, as we've said, you write about all these amazing different rituals celebrated by different cultures around the world. The research in the book is extraordinary. And I didn't realize I was embarrassed uh, by how little I understood about how much rituals were connected to nature, including things like days of the week or why there are 24 hours in the day. It was mind blowing. Um, but I wanted to ask if you could define what a ritual is and what we use them for. Why do we need them? So I think that, you know, I think really the reason we need them is to process change. I think that there is constant change over the course of our lives and it's very difficult to wrap our minds around it. And I think a ritual is something we do that is meaningful and that, you know, we could do another way. You know, there are very small rituals um, and there are very large ones that, you know, thousands of people do together or millions around the world. Um, and then there are the little private things that you do. Maybe you take a, um, specific way home and you think, okay, when I go over this bridge, I'm going to leave everything that all the stress of the office at home and I'm going to start my evening. And that little portal, I think, is so much of what ritual is about. The idea that, you know, in, in, in the technical sense, like the, the idea of a rite of passage is this idea of this threshold, like a wedding, where you start a, you know, unmarried, you go through the ritual, you go through this doorway, and at the end, you are different, you're together. Um, and I think that rituals, it's, that's what it's really about. It's going through a little portal and saying, okay, my work day is done, or my day is starting, or my year is starting, or, you know, whatever it is that changes in your mindset. And then I think the other element is, you know, we have this it's a way of, of wrapping our mind around time passing and, you know, a birthday, right? We get one day older every day, but a birthday lets us think, oh my goodness, a whole year has passed since this. I'm now this. I, you know, and, and actually like look at it because it's impossible to feel that every second of every day. And we have to look at it from, oh, take a step back and think, oh, this is, this is what's happened. And I think that, you know, 
there is just so much change we experience over the course of our lives. And it's very difficult for us to wrap our minds around. And I think we've invented these little passageways um, from one kind of perspective to another around the world because we, we need them emotionally. What were some of the rituals that you came across in your research that really blew your mind? Oh, well, I really love um, the land diving in Vanuatu um, and like, especially as a coming of age ritual, because to me, the idea of taking a giant leap in front of your community is, um, is such, that's a, that is the almost performance art version of what it's like to grow up and what it's like to do any of the sort of performative things that we do to say, I mean, right, like anything you do that's a coming of age ceremony, it's not like, okay, you're a kid and then you do this thing and now you're an adult, but it's a way of saying you're in this change and it happens for different people at different times and, you know, um, gradually in many cases. Um, and, but this is the transition that we're going through and, you know, you're going to have to let some of the stuff of childhood go. Um, but you're going to get this thrill of all the things you get to do as a grown up that are really fun. And I, I think that that, that sort of stuff really, um, you know, when, when the ritual really clearly represents the emotional or biological event, I find that so beautiful and stirring and meaning, excuse me, meaningful. And we should just clarify that land diving okay. is exactly what it sounds like. It's yes. young men climbing a very, very tall tree with vines. It's basically bungee jumping, but yes. you're not doing it with, a, with any kind of elastic cord and you're not doing it over water. So yes. if you get it wrong, the, the consequences are very serious. And But over thousands of years in Vanuatu, they have gotten really good at knowing exactly what time of year the vine is the most pliable. So as long as it's within that time frame, it's, there, there are very, as, my, as I understand it, there are very few injuries. But it's, yes, it's jumping off into the unknown. Yeah. You say in the book that old rituals aren't intrinsically better than new ones. Old ones are, have often been used to exclude people, to discriminate. And just because we always did something one way doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. How do we turn a practice then into a ritual? Well, it's so, I mean, that's the thing is I think people feel this, this pressure to not be the first to break the long chain. But and we're all, all in your own family as well. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, but I think that what we, what I keep coming back to is no matter what you're doing, you're not doing it the same way that your ancestors were doing it a few thousand years ago. And in order, like a life form in order or a species, um, in order to survive, I think traditions have to mutate and you have to just take what you can. And I think that often, you know, they're built atop other things that other people were doing with totally different theological or mythological worldviews. And I think that in terms of what you create for yourself um, and inventing something new, I mean, it's hard sometimes to start a new tradition, especially if it involves other people, you know, if it can feel like kind of contrived. Um, but I think there's something really, you know, it, re it requires trial and error for sure. And I, but I think that there's something really meaningful about looking to do the things that actually reflect what you believe and, you know, or just what you value, you know, whether it's, and, and there are a lot of things that we do that maybe we don't see as rituals, but if you get together, you know, with your best friends for a dinner party once a month, I'm, you know, or you, um, you know, every weekend you and your family take, go somewhere special and do, you know, have a picnic or something. Those things are rituals. Um, we just, it's very hard to see them that way. And even now, and especially under quarantine and lockdown, you know, I think so many people are, um, you know, whether it's like meditation from an app or like YouTube yoga classes, these are things that um, come from a religious tradition, but have taken on a secular life of their own. And they are still rituals. If you think, okay, every night before bed, I have to meditate. Um, that is a ritual. And I think where, where the line is between something you do, um, you know, as a habit, um, 
and a ritual is the question of, well, is it meaningful to you? And is it something that, that you have a little story behind why this is important to you and what this does for you emotionally? There are also rituals you talk about in the book, though. They're not only frameworks to make us feel good. They're not all yeah. only frameworks. They're, they're also frameworks to help us remember there are things that we're not supposed to do. Can you talk about some of those? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, th th there's th there are so many um, taboos in societies and, you know, things that are forbidden. And some of them may have real... Um, there may be a really helpful route to some, some dietary restrictions. There's some evidence to suggest that those were for safety reasons and things like that. And then, you know, sexual taboos, right? They go from a, being really unfair and discriminatory to like, you know, okay, well, you know, we have to arrange ourselves somehow and like not just, you know, do have sex all the time, all day long with, you know, yeah, I'm like, you know, no I think that, <laughs> I think that there's you know that line of like well is this something that was invented because is it a is it anachronistic is it something that we just don't need anymore is it something that was invented to exclude um, is it something that was invented out of fear a fear that we don't need to have anymore or is this something that serves us in some way and I think that questioning of ourselves and questioning of the status quo and questioning of um, you know the things that we were taught um, and actually looking at it with fresh eyes I think that that's so crucial in in any system of the way humans organize themselves and I think that's something that you can really see as a value from science is this idea of not just taking things for granted because they were told to you from a position of authority. I wonder if you can reflect from your own experience and from the research you did in the book as well about what happens when uh, you describe all the way throughout your, the book that there are lots of traditions or lots of rituals in your family um, from your parents that were um, that felt familiar. There were things that were done in their household or meals that were prepared or certain times of year in Jewish culture where certain things were celebrated. But that you also were honest in the book and you say that you said to your mother at one point, I, I really want a Christmas tree. I have to have a Christmas tree because <laughs> you were a teenager and you lived in America, you live in America, and you felt that was the cultural it was your kind of cultural right to, to celebrate Christmas in some way, shape or form. But I'm wondering if you can reflect on what happens to us when we kind of morph into other people's rituals. We if we take on so many of them, do we kind of lose our own, our own sense of what our own ones are? If we're just sort of trying them on all the time, I suppose, where, where's that? How, how do we strike a balance between our own cultural identity and the trying on of other people's rituals? Right. Well, I think that, you know, there are certain things like appropriation that are different than taking on the majority thing, you know, and I did, I totally, yes, it's true. I totally made my mom get me a Christmas tree. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but, and, and it's, it's funny because it's, it's the kind of thing, you know, when you're a kid, you want to be, you know, you don't want to be different. And, um, and I think that's very normal. And I think as we explore things, and follow our interests in terms of rituals and culture and stuff like that. I think, you know, it's, it's something that everyone has to do for themselves and figure out what works for them. Um, but I also think that the, the crucial element is really learning the history and um, knowing why things are the way they are and why, um, where these things came from. And I mean, we did, when I was a kid, my mother would do, Easter eggs with me. We would paint Easter eggs. And I didn't ever think of it as a Christian thing because it's very, to me, very, you know, pagan. And it doesn't write the whole, like the colorful eggs thing is so much about springtime. And, and so, you know, in talking about the traditions in my family that we did, you know, we had the, the Passover Seder in the spring every year, but we had it from a secular point of view and told this you know it's traditionally it's the story of exodus and we talked about you know what that meant in in the context of this is this is the story about our ancestors when they were enslaved 
we're free now, we're really lucky, but lots of people around the wor world, literally and metaphorically, are still enslaved by poverty, by racism, but by all these social ills. And this has to be a reminder that not everybody is as lucky as we are right now, and we used to be in their shoes. So let's take a moment to reflect on that so we can drive ourselves forward um, to do good in the world. And I think that, that that idea of springtime as a rebirth, which you know is literal and metaphorical in so many of the spring holidays, um, is really powerful. And that it doesn't require any any belief, but the Easter eggs to me were just this this beautiful little piece of art again that we could do to celebrate that. Like you know, we I grew up in a very cold place, yeah, and it meant a lot to know that the trees were going to blossom soon. So you're also reminding us that it's also about the eyes through which you see stuff. So for someone for whom the Easter egg was a religious symbol, you might be taking on their symbol and doing yeah. something. With for you, it was um, a, a, some, a different kind of ritual, a different kind of celebration. So it's always about perspective. I wanted to jump around a little bit, though. There's a chapter in your book called Independence Days, and you were just talking about, you know, the, the significance of the messages that your, you and your family thought about over the Passover meal, about um, being 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 freed from slavery, being freed from bondage. But you, in this chapter, in Independence Days, you write about the mythology around America. You write about myths a lot in the book. And that you write, you find it hard to hold both the aspirations of America and its crimes in your head at the same time. And that as a society, it suffers from a fear of complexity. I didn't want to lose an opportunity because you yeah. are in Houston now to ask you about, um, you know, given the kinds of deep thinking you've been doing around your own life and creating meaning and what that means and the kind of society you want to create for your own child, if you can reflect on what's what you feel about what's happening in your country right now in relation to um, how a society and a nation can move beyond what's happening in America. Absolutely. I mean, the United States was founded and built on the enslavement of Africans and the obliteration of Native American societies. I mean, there's just no question about it. This is what this country is. And if we don't face it, if we don't come to terms with it, um, and we don't reckon with our guilt and our privilege for those of us who are in that position, and we don't come face to face with the systems that keep people oppressed, we cannot move forward. And I think that this idea of questioning authority, questioning ourselves as a value cannot just be a pathway to you know scientific discovery it also has to be a pathway to justice and it also has to be a way in which we can find um a, an, an understanding that we are all a part of the system that oppresses people and part of the system that is a source of violence and cruelty and i think that um, you know, uprisings work, not always, but sometimes they do. And when I see, you know, and we've been out there, and when I see people by the thousands in the streets, it gives me hope. Um, because if we don't, you know, it's not like, it's like a, you know, if somebody is a cruel, oppressive, abusive person, and then just says, oh, sorry, let's not talk about it. Let's just move on. That's not a solution. We have to actually face this and come to terms with it and look at why this is happening and what are the pieces in place that are making this a centuries old crime. And so I think that, you know, I, I listen, I've lived with the exception of study abroad for a semester and two years in the UK. I have, I have lived in the United States all my life and there is so much about it that I love but I think you know as James Baldwin said like it's if you love a country then you know the I, I think he said I love America more than any other country in the world and that's why I have I reserve the right to criticize her I think it's it's again we have to examine our reality if we want to move forward and I think it was your parents also who wrote a fantastic essay called um, real patriots ask questions and there seems to be a lot of that 
um, in, in many of the things you've talked about this evening about how your 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 way of using science to make sense of the world is about questioning, always questioning, turning things over, discarding what doesn't work anymore, what turns out to be wrong or false or discriminatory or, dis or exclusionary and moving forward to a new truth or a new set of rules or a new way of um, making sense of the world. I want to ask you one more question and then I'm going to open up for questions from our audience. So if you've got questions, please feel free to put them in the YouTube live chat or you can send them to the Brisbane Writers' Festival during um, through the Facebook Messenger. That would be fantastic and we'll get to them in a moment. Um, your parents coined a phrase for people who like to make meaning out of almost anything. I think it might have been your mother. And um, they called it that they, they called it that kind of person a significance junkie. And Hannah, I just wondered before I we opened to the audience, you know, are you, are you one of those people? Are you a significance <laughs> junkie yourself? Well, I think that it's, I mean, I do love significance, but I try, <laughs> but I try not to um force it, you know, and I think that that, you know, we've all had these experiences in our lives where there's an astonishing coincidence. You're thinking of someone and they call, you run into someone, you know, from childhood on the other side of the planet, whatever it is, where you just think, this is a little bit too on the nose, you know, and I have had those experiences in my life that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And I think that urge to say, this is a sign, this means something, um, this is a clue into the inner workings of the universe is so powerful because we're so, we so crave that feeling of like understanding what's at play, what's happening. But I think that that kind of thing, I do not ascribe significance to. I just enjoy that, you know, once in a while, you know, the lottery hit, someone wins the lottery. We exactly. said we talk about the vitamins of the universe and we are. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think that it's still beautiful and amazing when an old friend calls the moment you were thinking about them. But I don't think it's a message from, I mean, I think it's a message from the friend, not from, exactly. uh, from Mount not High. From, from higher being, exactly. Okay, so I've got a lovely question here. What is Sasha's favorite, what's your favorite ritual to celebrate um, and why? I mean, I love, I love the Passover Seder. Um, we still do it. Um, and now I have a daughter and I get to share it with her. And that, you know, this year, you know, we were under quarantine. So it was just the three of us, my husband, my daughter and I, and we still did it. We got dressed up. Um, and that was really meaningful. The other ritual that I love that is specific to our family uh, that I write about in the book is um, we had a Speaking of random chance, we happened to one day in Washington, D.C., get into the taxi of a very wise sort of nosy gentleman who asked us, we were having a serious conversation about my husband's job, and he, the gentleman asked us, um, you know, how long we'd been married, and we, we were newlyweds, and I, I won't regale you with the whole story, it's in the book, but essentially he broke into song and insisted <laughs> that we join him, which we did. We were like, is this happening? And he said, you know, you've got to sing every, every week. It's really important. And so my husband and I sing the alphabet song every weekend. And I mean, now we have a toddler, so it's a little more appropriate. More but, now. Exactly. Yeah, it's less embarrassing. <laughs> <It's great before. laughs> yeah, when it was just two people in their 30s belting out <laughs> the alphabet song every Saturday morning. But that's something that's so small and so silly in a lot of ways, but it's so meaningful to us. And, um, you know, that's an example of something that you can create, you know, spontaneously and it just sticks. Mm. Uh, questions here. Um, how did you research the rituals for your book? And someone else has asked, did you travel to any of the cultures or was it all mostly kind of online research for you or books? It, it was mostly books and online. I have been lucky enough to travel, um, over the course of my life. And there was a lot of inspiration drawn from the places that I had been. And in some cases from what I had experienced there, but I really, I love the work of Karen Armstrong. She has a totally different philosophical point of view than I do, but she's a historian of religion who writes beautifully. And I learned um, a lot about the history of the Abrahamic religions from her work. And I you should know, say that, that your, your book actually has a reading list at the back. It's one of those yes. magic books for people that it, you can actually see some of the things that Sasha has read and get a handle on them your, on yourself, which is really wonderful. Keep going. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. And you know, so much of, so often it was, you know, starting with Google and then would find a book that was about that. And then that book would 
you know, have a line or two about something and I thought, oh, what's that? And then find more information. And it was just um, sort of just following those threads. And, you know, in some cases I got to, you know, talk to people over the phone um, or in person and ask them, them questions about their research. And um, it was, uh, it was really um, a exciting, fun process to be able to learn about so many of these, these beautiful, beautiful traditions. Someone else has asked um, whether you have any tips on finding ways to keep finding awe and wonder or purpose in life, even when we're going through turbulent times? Oh, yeah. Well, I would say that my first tip is hang out with small children. Um, they are full of wonder and awe. And like, you know, my daughter, she's nearly three. And like, she freaks out every time she sees the moon. And it's like, it's, um, it's like fireworks to her, you know, it's astonishing. And I just think, you know, it's so easy to lose that, to be blasé and be like, yeah, it's the moon. <laughs> What's the big deal? But when you see it through the eyes of a small child and, you know, we have learned, my husband and I have learned so much more about the phases of the moon than we ever knew over the last six months since she's developed this interest. And I think that like taking that step back and saying, wow, there's this satellite that orbits us, that controls the tides, that um, changes over the course of the month. It's just so amazing and beautiful. And I think taking that step back and sort of trying to look at the planet through the eyes of, you know, imagining you were from, from another world and trying to learn, you know, see the world, our world through the eyes of an outsider, I think can be so um, powerful. And yeah, I think, you know, these are turbulent times and this is really scary and, and that's real. And but I think also the more you learn history, um, the more you read history, the more you realize that we've, our species has been through a lot. There are while we to get some more questions coming through. I want to put another one to you. It was something that we talked about before when I mentioned that throughout the book, you talk about how rituals are inspired by the natural world. And as I said to you, I was amazed to discover how many of them are inspired by biological processes. Can you talk about some of them? I mean, we talked about days of the week, why there are 24 hours in a day, but right. seasons, all kinds of things. Can you give a few of those examples? Because they are, they really do blow your hair back. Yeah, well, so the, the, the equinoxes and solstices, right? The, obviously, and we're in different hemispheres, you and I talking, but the moment that, you know, the long, and I really try not to be a Northern hemisphere chauvinist, but it's the moment that- I appreciate that, we appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, but the moment, you know, the longest day of the year in one part of the world and the shortest day of the year, you know, simultaneously occurring and so many of the winter, you know, of course, because of colonialism and imperialism, people celebrate holidays in places that the holiday did not originate. But, you know, these, this idea that in, you know, in, on the shortest day of the year, when things are really dark and cold, we need celebration. And so many of the holidays that in the Northern Hemisphere fall around December 21st are rooted in that. And then, you know, the equinox, the spring equinox, um, the harvest festivals. I mean, that's one of the things that I find really beautiful too, is like this idea of these festivals that we have in the moments of abundance, you know, when there's a lot to eat, when everything is ready to be harvested and that all over the world, there are celebrations that celebrate a specific plant, you know, when it's that moment to harvest rice or wheat or grapes or whatever it is. And that that is really beautiful to me because it's such a reflection on the animal plant relationship and that we have these moments that, you know, maybe we don't think of them when, you know, in the United States, like when we have Thanksgiving, but that is rooted in our, our harvest festival and, and that there's gratitude for the abundance of nature. And I think it was something that you said your mother used to say around Thanksgiving, that she used to say, you, you don't need to know who to thank in order to give thanks. To yes. A lovely other. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that sense of gratitude, even if it's just that we are the beneficiaries of so much random chance, I think that um, really finding beauty in that and, and, and gratitude is, is meaningful, even if you don't believe that it's um, preordained. 
we still have a little bit more time for people's questions. If you want to send them to, to Sasha and to myself, that would be lovely. But, but in the meantime, I wanted to ask you um, actually about your father, which is that you, you know, you talked about how you grew up without organized structured kind of religion in your life. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could reflect a bit on what it was like to mourn him, what it's been like to mourn him all these years without that framework of religion and, and what yeah. you can understand about that through the work you did for this book. Yeah, I think that, you know, that moment when you lose someone um, and you're just in that cloud, you know, and uh, of grief and sometimes shock, to have an infrastructure that's already in place of what to do is so useful. And it's such a valuable thing that religion offers. Um, and to have a map in that moment. And I think that, you know, we did certain things that were traditionally Jewish um, at that time. Um, but I think that there's something really valuable about that. And as I was researching um, different, you know, religious um, and cultural practices around death and grieving and mourning, there were certain ones that I just thought, like a little like bell went off where I thought, wow, yes, that's really powerful. And like in ancient Egypt, there was a period of time where after um, the loss of a patriarch, um, the women in the family would go through the streets bare chested, beating their chests. And, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, we should let's start that up again. But I'm just saying that was like such a little clear you could over the eons you could see into the feelings and emotions that are so real and so human of people who lived in a totally different society and you know one of the jewish traditions that i love that i think is so beautiful is during shit like when you sit shiva so like the wake essentially you cover the mirrors and the idea that you just don't worry about like your eyeliner right now just like you know what i mean don't think about how you look and that kind of thing where, where you have these little little windows into the idea that every society around the world throughout history had to reckon with this feeling that you're experiencing that we all have to deal with was, was so powerful. And, you know, I think that, that the other kind of, of rituals that really I found stirring were the ones that acknowledge that it's a long Road and we have some of that in Judaism, um, where you know for a year you you do certain things after a death, but but just the idea that like it doesn't it's not like it happens and it's over. You still have to reckon with it for a long time, and um, I, I found that really powerful too. There was a beautiful tradition that you write about. I think it was Japanese in the book where when someone dies, their ancestors, the, their their living family members, dress up as the person who's just died. Oh, it was, it's an, it was an ancient Chinese, um, I forget which dynasty, I have to look at tradition where it was um, this practice where, um, so when the patriarch died, the son would go through this very intense um, mourning period um, and sleep outside and do all of these things um, to help the patriarch transition into the world of the ancestors. And then the son, so the grandson of the person who had died would take on the role of his grandfather and dress up as him and, and have um, this, um, you know, ceremony where he would sort of take on this role. And I just kept thinking while I was reading about it, um, how, intense that must have been and how powerful and in a world with no photography and no recording when you never you lose someone and you literally never see them again in the sense that at least now you know we have a video or an image or something and to have that for the father to see their son in that role I just think god that must have been overwhelming um and and it's it, to me that that is so profound and beautiful and just how many different ways human beings have de devised to reckon with this idea. You did something a little bit like that yourself. There's a beautiful story to yeah. the end of the book where your mother was filming an episode and she asked you if you would play the role, a non-speaking role on, on camera as your grandmother. So in, in a scene where your father is a young child 
and it reminded me a bit of that ancient tradition. You were stepping, sort of stepping into back into the shoes of your family to sort of maybe even channel what it would have been like. Absolutely. It was such a surreal experience. And the grandmother I never knew who I, but I feel very connected with. I, I my middle name is for her. And um, it was a little bit like getting to time travel, you know, and it was such, and getting dressed up in the hair and the makeup, um, and, uh, and being in the set that was like the apartment that my father grew up in. It was, I mean, it was really, it was very, very parallel to that. Uh, there's one last question I want to put to you before we finish, which is that, um, someone's asked, are there any particular, uh, significant life event rituals that you'd like to raise your daughter with? Yes. I mean, I, I really, I want to leave it open to her when she gets to the point where she can say, I want this. I don't want this for now. I think just as many <laughs> different celebrations and rituals as I can offer to her, um, are great. My husband's family, I mean, both my husband and I are secular, but his family, you know, he grew up with Christian traditions and we do those too. And, um, and we do, you know, all sorts of things that are sort of peculiar to our family, like the alphabet song. Um, and I think my, my job as a mom is to, at this stage, give her as many as I can and then follow her lead when she gets a little bit older. And, you know, people sometimes ask me, well, what if she doesn't carry on, you know, the Seder or these other Jewish traditions? And I, my position is, I mean, we'll see, maybe I'll eat these words in 20 years, but my <laughs> position right now is it's none of my business. I can only present to her what has worked for me and leave her the opportunity to figure out what works for her. It's a beautiful. Beautiful. It's a beautiful perspective to have. I mean, you've shown us tonight all the different ways that cultures are connected through the ways they celebrate, you know, moments in life. Your parents taught and wrote that and spoke that message through all of their work. And you've also reminded us of that in your work. Um, thank you for showing us the multitude of ways that we could be more connected to each other than we realize. And I wanted to say um, thank you as well to our audience for being with us tonight. And Brisbane Writers Festival have more events online planned. So in the coming months, you can check those out by visiting the Brisbane Writers, um, Brisbane Writers Festival website where you can see all those details. But for now, I wanted to thank everyone who joined us tonight and to thank you, Sasha Sagan, for your time and generosity and your beautiful ideas in this powerful and really timely book. But for now, stay well, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.